So this is webinar. This is webinar 15, Inclusive and Equitable OER, uh, day three of the Open Education Global um, International Conference. And uh, thank you so much to the organizers. Uh, I know it is a great deal of organization, whether it's face-to-face, -face, blended, or fully online. And uh, hopefully someday in the future, we'll be able to um, be seeing each other face-to-face -face again. Lovely to always meet up with our community in a joyful way. Um, you may be noticing that behind me, I have a, um, a bright orange, uh, says every child matters. Tomorrow is September 30th in Canada, where I'm coming from. And it is our first national recognition of uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Report and the uh, reconciliation work that Canadians are participating in as we understand and work together with Indigenous peoples throughout our country. So it's a, it's a sad day in many ways, and it's part of understanding the colonization and the history of residential schools in our country. So it's a tension, uh, how education can sometimes be used for important, useful applications, and then also in, 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 in the example of Canada as part of colonization and injustice. So um, with that, we have an opportunity today to think about open education and in this idea of inclusive and equitable OER. Our first presentation uh, is, uh, will be about 20 minutes. And then after that, we'll have a few minutes for questions. Then we'll move on to the next set of presentations. So the first one uh, we'll be presenting will be open for anti-racism, using open education to support anti-racist teaching. So this is James Glapla gross Clegg, Una Daly, Joy Shoemate, and Kim Green. So welcome and uh, let's start the learning. Thank you so much, Connie, um, and welcome everyone um, to the Open for Anti-Racism session. We're really so pleased that you could join us um, and um, to hear about this program uh, that we worked on last year with uh, 17 faculty from the California Community College System. Um, once again, I'm the director of the Community College Consortium for OER at Open Education Global, and I'm here with uh, my team. Um, who we who led this work last year, and I want to turn it over to them for a quick introduction. Hey, everybody. James Glover Grossclag. I'm a dean at College of the Canyons in California. I'm also a fellow uh, with the Michelson Twenty Million Minds Foundation, and glad to be here. Liz, did you want to say something? Oh, sorry, I didn't realize I was present. Hi, everybody. I'm I am the manager of communities of practice for open education global and i worked um on the ofar project and i'm still working on the ofar project <laughs> my name is kim gruey i'm an instructional designer primarily but i do a lot of professional development work and i have been working on this uh, ofar project since it started i'm very happy to be part of it and uh and i'm uh, happy to be here today Hi everyone, uh, my name is Joy Shoemate. I'm the Director of Online Education at College of the Canyons, uh, along with James in California. Um, and I'm just thrilled to be here with you and thrilled that we have the opportunity to share with you a bit about our project. Great, thank you all. Um, and you'll hear from them in just a moment. But I do also wanna thank um, our advisory coaches. These are the folks who worked uh, directly with our participants last year in implementing their anti-racist plans in the classroom. And um, what we're hoping you'll learn today um, is a little bit about the program design and support, including the research findings from last year, um, how OER and open pedagogy was used in the classroom, uh, for anti-racist pedagogy. And we have some wonderful examples of, from our participant projects um, and some resources that you can leverage for anti-racist pedagogy at your own institution or organization. And then talking just very briefly about how we're moving to a program this year from um, our pilot last year. And a huge thanks to the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation who have supported this work in the California Community College System. 
So for those of you who might not be familiar with community colleges, um, CCCOER has had the pleasure of working with community colleges um, for the last 10 years on promoting open education to enhance teaching and learning. Um, and just to let you know how big a system it is, 44% of our US undergraduates enroll at community colleges. And they go there for a number of reasons. It could be the first two years of university, or they could be getting a workforce um, certificate, or they could be preparing for college work. Uh, these are open access um, institutions that are very teaching focused. Uh, many of our students work full time and they may have families. They tend to be on the older end of the um, age spectrum for college. So what motivated this program? Um, last spring and summer in the United States was a time of a lot of pain and recognition of um, the racism in our society and how deeply embedded it was, uh, not only of course in our society, but are in our educational institutions. And there was many um, inspiring words put out, particularly at higher ed institutions um, around standing in solidarity for equality and racial justice, eliminating all forms of racism, but there weren't programs put in place for the classroom um, and how faculty uh, could move forward with this. And so we are so thankful to the William and Florida Hewlett Foundation, which really worked with us, um, recognized this, this uh, lack and worked with us to put this together. And here's a quick quote from one of our participants um, saying the program gave me the starting point and the confidence I needed to be frank and vulnerable with my students um, in order to uh, discuss race and privilege and how they themselves engage and perhaps perpetuate and benefit from racism. So there was this recognition that we need to see the racism first before we can move towards eliminating it. So along with um, the anti-racist focus, there was the realization that OER and open pedagogy could really be leveraged as tools. I think most of you uh, probably know what open educational resources are and open pedagogy, but it's that ability to be able to um, change resources that don't uh, represent voices of marginalized uh, students, learners, and educators. Um, and, and it's that ability, uh, or I should say, it's that uh, facility of um, an instructor working with their students to co-curate materials and uh, co-create materials uh, that can be then shared publicly. And, in fact, there was some studies done a couple years ago, this one in particular by a colleague of ours, uh, Dr. Shauna Brandle out of uh, the CUNY system that found that um, publisher textbooks um, and OER textbooks both had limited representation of historically marginalized groups. She specifically looked at American government textbooks, but um, the, only, the only upside to this is that um, since that realization, um, those of us who are working in the OER space are looking to make those changes to those openly licensed materials to incorporate those voices. Um, and perhaps in an even more serious matter, oops, <laughs> I'm hitting my time limit here, um, is the medical textbooks, which focus on only folks with white skin. And so doctors and physicians aren't being prepared to diagnose correctly um, conditions with people of dark skin. So our Open for Anti-Racism program, it, it's a year long program for faculty ex to explore the use of OER and open pedagogy to make their classrooms anti-racist. There's an online course you're just gonna hear about in a moment um, that they go through and then they develop an anti-racist action plan. And there's different supports through peer group coaching, uh, OER workshops, anti-racist webinars, and then there's research uh, done through surveys and interviews. And our first cohort was last year with 17 faculty members representing a wide array of disciplines from career technical ed through um, your uh, standard academic spaces. And I'd like to now turn this over to our course developers. Great, thank you, Una. Uh, so I am going to kick us off and uh, then I will pass it along to Kim. Kim and I had the pleasure of co-developing the course and co-facilitating it. Uh, so I will tell you a little bit about the course and then we'll move on over to Kim who will share a little bit about the projects that our um, 
participants, our faculty members created. So uh, first, as you see here, we developed a four week course um, utilizing Canvas as our LMS. And what we were exploring were the these four topics. First, what is anti-racism? So we had to define that. Um, what are open educational resources and how can they support anti-racism? Uh, exploring what is open pedagogy and uh, creating an anti-racism action plan. Uh, it's important for me to note that our participants came to uh, this course with a variety of skills and knowledge uh, concerning OER, open pedagogy, and anti-racism. So it was important that we made sure uh, we were defining all of those clearly and really setting the stage for the last, um, the last component of the course, which is for them to actually create an action plan where they implement uh, tangible changes within their course. Next slide, please. Thank you. So to start, we had to define uh, anti-racist pedagogy. And really what that involves is being explicitly race conscious, um, thinking about the systems and structures that are in place that uh, enable racism to function and in our society. Um, and then also taking a look at our own disciplines uh, to examine the history of those disciplines, examine um, how a lot of what we are teaching and learning and even the foundations of our fields of study have um, been influenced by um, or have benefited from um, racism in the past. So really it was just about elevating voices of um, uh, minoritized groups and considering the ways in which race can be brought into the conversation, uh, even if race isn't the, the focus of the course or of that particular subject matter, but really exploring again how, how disciplines, um, academic disciplines were informed by and often built um, off of and through and by um, racism. Okay, next slide please. Una. So next, after defining anti-racist pedagogy, we had to uh, spend some time kind of bridging the gap. As Una mentioned, it was really about how do we leverage open educational resources and open pedagogy to make our courses uh, more anti-racist. So it was really, again, I, I won't read all of those to you, but considering um, the, the voices of, um, of our authors, what perspective is being shared? Whose voices are we acknowledging and honoring as subject matter experts and whose voices are being left out of that? Um, really you know, engaging and further exploring um, how racism is connected to our fields of study um, and exploring ways in which we can elevate student voices and bring students into their own learning. Uh, one, so they not only see themselves in their learning, but also um, honoring and acknowledging the incredible talents and skills and experiences that they bring to the classroom uh, that really their peers and uh, us as instructors can benefit from learning from. Next slide, please. So this is another quote from one of our participants. Uh, I was interested in using open resources, but this program was a great opportunity to learn more about OER and connected anti-racist pedagogy to something um, that they were trying to do as well. So again, really trying to make that connection between you know, leveraging uh, open educational resources uh, to make courses more anti-racist. Great, and now I am going to pass it on over to uh, my co-facilitator, co-developer, Kim Gruy. Thank you so much, Joy. Uh, I think you can tell Joy and I very much have enjoyed working together on this. And, um, and so the action plan template, uh, that was something that uh, we kept purposely nebulous and uh, sort of unstructured so that um, faculty could do that could walk that talk, right, of trying to figure out when something, uh, the problem, uh, define the problem. So we asked them to think um, just, you know, we provided some structure in a template, but asked them to think about what can they do right now in their own classrooms. And then also to think even into the future, like, and then once you do that, 
how can you scale that up and bring other people along? And uh, next slide, please, Una. What they came up with, it's so hard to choose among the 17 to share with you today, but we're gonna share a few of those. One of these is from a, a, one of our science professors, Anna Garcia Garcia, and she wanted to make her science courses uh, 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 anti-racist uh, using some open pedagogical approaches. And what she did, next slide, please, Una. Um, she created, uh, yes, there you go, uh, an assignment in her course where students would um, look, uh, do some research and find a scientist, in essence, that looked like them. And as Una has mentioned, you know, we know about our textbooks tend to uh, sort of just regurgitate the, the information that we've been given before, but this way students are looking to scientists that maybe have not been listed in the textbooks and highlighted and focused upon, but have contributed valuable, um, you know, made valuable contributions nonetheless. So here's one example, students would create basically a page that would explain a little bit about the scientists and the contributions and the connections. So again, connections. So that was for a science class. Next slide, please, Una. And this is a business class. Uh, this is Deborah Crump from Crumpton, excuse me, from the Sacramento City College. And Deborah's a business professor who injected uh, anti-racism into her courses. And next slide, please. Um, what she did is she took topics that maybe weren't necessarily with a, a, a social justice or a racist or an anti-racism lens, and she created uh, assignments that actually, in fact, did focus on race. And, and one of those was to look at racial bias in marketing. And another one of those was uh, to look at a significant, significant racially minoritized entrepreneur. And with Deborah, if, if you, yes, thank you, Runa. Um, you know, Deborah uh, 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 had made some comments here, reflections that it requires you to move through racism in order to get to the anti-racism and that it is a, a requirement to do that. And it takes a lot of a time and energy and work, but, you know, just so you know, we're all committed to it and the outcomes uh, as a result of this work are so valuable that it's totally worth uh, some of that tension that we lean into. We've talked about that a lot. The next slide, please. So this is a history professor. This is Oliver Rosales at Bakersfield uh, Community College. And he did an, uh, what he calls a radical archiving. Um, he takes um, student, he, he, he works with his students and has them interview, bring in pictures and talk to people in their community and then in their families and creates that um, and, and makes them understand that they can be historians that way and that the history of a place is a history of the people. And it's a really exciting project where he brings his student voice and uh, students' voices in um, for the, the history project. And then the last one, please, Una, uh, that I'll share with you today. This is Nakia Cheney's English module uh, and as she teaches a composition course. And she created a module which she shared out in the Canvas Commons um, exploring the Black Lives Matter movement. And, um, and uh, you know, for, for Nakia, she also, you know, for her, like what, what really was special about this project was that she realized how important sort of her journey was in connecting with students. And she was able to kind of put her story to the forefront there and use that to guide uh, the work that she was doing and to inspire her own students. Um, and those links will be shared out and that you can check those out. And then the last slide I think that I'm doing here, very excited to let you all know for a lot of times when we presented, we didn't have this ready to share yet, but as of uh, August, it's been ready to share. So there's both a facilitated and a non-facilitated version if you're interested that you can access and use as is or modify. And so uh, I'm excited to be able to share that with you. I think that's the end of my piece. And to James. Great, thank you so much, Kim and Joy for describing, describing the course. Um, yeah, I'm gonna move into, whoops, I gotta adjust my view there, sorry about that. Um, I wanna share one more, one more quote from our participants, uh, one of whom said, learning from my peers in OFAR was great. There were other faculty that teach such an array of different disciplines to see how they are using anti-racism really inspired me to see how I can use it myself. And I think many of us here are, deeply involved in professional development and training for our colleagues. So we understand the value of getting out of your own environment and learning from uh, what others are doing in other environments. That was certainly an advantage to this program. Uh, one other piece of support that our participants enjoyed was to um, 
to have access to uh, dedicated OER support. So some of our participants were unfamiliar with open educational resources or open ed education generally. So the OER team that works with me and Joy here at College of the Canyons provided monthly workshops and open office hours on searching for OER, open licensing, and so on topics I think most of us are very familiar with. In addition, throughout the spring term, uh, we invited uh, guest speakers who were mostly well steeped in anti-racism, some who work at the intersection of anti-racism and, and OER to, uh, to deliver webinars for our participants. So that was uh, an added uh, exposure to expert, uh, expert information and expert, uh, experts uh, in their network. Um, and then we devoted a lot of energy and time to research, to documenting the impact. Uh, you'll see on the screen here the uh, research questions. I'm not going to read them all, but really the crux was question one, can anti-racist teaching, uh, can anti-racist instructional materials uh, improve student outcomes, success and retention of the outcomes that we look at here in California? But can, can we improve student outcomes? How do students uh, perceive what's going on in the classroom? Can open pedagogy contribute to anti-racism? And then um, do, uh, do the faculty, of course, recommend using an open pedagogy as an anti-racism tool? Next slide, please. Uh, uh, we, we looked at, uh, we tried to document impact. We did document impact in a number of ways. You'll see a lot of, lot of activity here. Uh, first of all, we engaged an external evaluator, an external research, uh, research company or research uh, organization to help us. Uh, participants, the faculty completed pre-surveys, post-surveys, they sat for interviews. Um, they gave a presentation uh, on their own campus, doing outreach on their own campus. We documented the number of students they impacted, uh, students themselves in the classes where the uh, change was taking place. They, they participated in a survey uh, and so on and so on. The next couple of slides, I'll share some of those uh, results. But first, yeah, go ahead. Uh, first, one more quote from uh, from a participant, a student participant, uh, who said that the racial assignment, because it brought, the racial assignment was uh, helpful because it brought a real life problem into our learning and made it more interesting. So that's terrific to hear. And um, we had a lot of feedback like that from uh, students. So here are some, uh, some data on the student perceptions. Uh, those, the number, the percentage of students who felt more engaged or more active, 88%. Those who said they almost always had opportunities to provide their own perspectives, 87%. They almost always in their classes examined the history of the discipline, 92%. Going back to what Joy shared about anti-racist pedagogy, and they almost always used classroom content to identify and challenge challenges and biases, so 80%. So uh, positive, very positive, uh, satisfying outcomes for us there. Uh, the faculty participants, uh, they said that they, throughout, throughout the term, you'll see on the left-hand side, the teaching practices that they uh, implemented. And, uh, uh, you know, the first two are terrific. We're, we're, happy to, we're happy to read those. They engage students to co-create anti-racism modules. Interestingly, uh, the last bullet on the left-hand side was a bit lower. Engage in explicit conversations around race. That, that's something we hope to explore more uh, in this coming year to understand what where and why participants might have some a little bit of hesitancy around that. Uh, our participants said they had an increased understanding around anti-racist teaching practices, OER and open pedagogy. So all terrific, terrific uh, numerical results there. Next slide, please, Uda. And finally, faculty recommendations. Uh, they plan to continue doing doing what worked and that's that's the you know amazing news for us they plan to engage continue engaging students to co-create materials on anti-racism they plan to continue incorporating student voices implementing inclusive images and then the last bullet again engage in explicit conversations around race it's still not bad but uh certainly a lower response to that particular prompt than others so that's again something we'd like to explore this coming year uh, most of our overwhelming pr proportion of our participants said they would recommend participation to others. And 100% said the most effective strategy for enhancing the learning experience was open pedagogy. And to those of you who are familiar with that, I'll say the idea, and I think Jim and uh, Joy and Kim can confirm, that, confirm this, the idea of the non-disposable assignment was really, 
enthusiastically embrace. You know, you can see the light bulbs going off when you when you introduce that. So uh, that was good fun. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this year, um, uh, this academic year, 21-22, uh, we are able, again, thanks to the Hewlett Foundation, to continue and indeed expand the program so that we are going to support 40 faculty from around California, community colleges, but we're going to uh, expand the focus to uh, have deeper institutional impacts, meaning that rather than serving inst supporting in individual faculty, uh, say 40 faculty from 40 different institutions, we're soliciting applications from teams of faculty at institutions. So we expect to be able to serve, say, six, seven, eight teams from six, seven, or eight institutions. And the teams would have four or five or six uh, faculty on a team so that there's more of a, of a support network developed at that institution. So we can have a greater likelihood of changing something uh, or embedding something in the institution. We're also going to measure the student outcomes, compare past a couple of past semesters of student outcomes in the classes that are taught by the participating faculty with the outcomes from the semester in which they're implementing their change and one semester past the time when they've implemented their change. Hope, hopefully something will stick, right? We wanna see that there's a long-term change there. So that's very exciting. In fact, we just closed applications on Monday and Boy, once again, an overwhelming interest, uh, just many, 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 many more uh, uh, applications than we can uh, possibly accommodate. So it's exciting to see the demand is there. Next slide, please. And if we have a few minutes left for discussion, Connie, uh, we'd love to hear from everyone here. What does inclusive teaching and learning for social justice look like at your at your institution in your context? Are you explicitly talking about anti-racism? Are you talking about equity? What does this look like in your context? How does open support your work uh, to advance social justice? Um, and uh, what are you what are you hoping in in doing this work or in tackling this work at your institution? And maybe do you have ideas for us? So we'll turn it over to the audience, I think. Well, thank you so much. Um, that was very exciting to see that work, James. I can, um, so many people working in the same direction, helping everyone work. It's hard work. Anti-racism is hard, difficult work and um, so needed. So um, I love your questions there. We'll see if some people would uh, take the microphone or turn on their video if they're inclined as well. Um, there are some uh, discussions in the chat, but maybe there's somebody who wants to provide a comment right away or a question to this presentation. Yeah, I see Eb, our friend Eva, my friend Eva made an interesting comment in the chat. Uh, maybe a culture different approach, uh, but how is this different from so-called ordinary education using open education to support anti-racist teaching? Um, so Eva, what we, you know, what we found, I think uh, there's a developing or an evolving understanding in open education or OER generally that uh, many times open textbooks or OERs are created by people who are deeply embedded in the system, uh, the existing system. And certainly in the United States, uh, a lot of uh, open textbooks or OERs are created by people who look like me, who bring with, uh, with them the biases that, that that I might have. Uh, so uh, you might create free learning materials for students, but you're not necessarily creating materials for students that help students see their lived reality. Uh, you might be re recreating patriarchy. You might be recreating uh, white centeredness or the centeredness of the dominant culture and not giving voice to other cultures simply because you as the author, you come from that culture. Does that, does that help a bit, Eva? Does that make sense? Uh, no, uh, actually not. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but I understand your point very much. But um, for me, I think it is. Um, I'm not sure, but um, uh, those issues which you have been raised in your presentation, that is, I mean, what we have to consider uh, all the time with so-called uh, ordinary uh, campus education uh, without using OER. <clears throat> to always to, to consider um, um, 
those issues which you have raised. I was wondering how, how what is the, the uh, added uh, values and benefits um, which is not, which you don't uh, cover. Uh, uh, I mean, in my country, in Sweden, this is that you, you always have to take uh, those issues uh, for granted, whatever you are doing, whatever kind of topic you're raising in your education, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm wondering what is the added value with uh, OER, if you understand my question. Well, perhaps, and I'll, I'll make one brief remark and then turn it over to others. Uh, I, I would say I envy Sweden if it's if this is taken for granted. Uh, it's certainly not taken for granted in the United States. Perhaps uh, among some of us, some of us it, it is, but uh, amongst many people, uh, it is not taken for granted that uh, uh, educators will tackle tackle these issues. In fact, in the United States, uh, we have examples of state or provincial governments and local governments passing laws to prohibit the discussion of race or the discussion of discrimination uh, so that if we were not in California, for example, but if we lived in uh, different states, we would be uh, violating the law by running this program. So uh, it's incredibly Im impactful, I think, in the context of the United States, at least. Okay, I would, I would say my country, for example, uh, if you don't uh, take those issues uh, uh, very seriously, um, there will be a lot of complaints. Uh, so, so I mean that it, it is by default in 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 the education system. That's wonderful. But maybe yeah. it's cultural difference differences. Thank you, thank you, James. Good, Jim. Um, thanks, James. Um, I I I really liked your answer. Um, as a matter of fact, I I want to get that captured because the timing is perfect for something else that I want to write. But um, I I think. And, 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 and partly to get to Abba's uh, point, in my experience, and I teach at a community college and have for a long time, um, one of the challenges, and this speak is the variety, the differentiation, the variety, the, the heterogeneity of students at community colleges in the United States. Um, relative to the sources of the books. And this this even goes for, as, as James was talking about, at least the, the first wave of big OER books like in, you know, and, and don't get me wrong, I am not being critical of OpenStax, but, um, you know, they are in effect an OER, you know, I mean, they were the first wave and they're an OER copy of the other publishers. And in the US, you run, those materials don't speak to very many students. And that, is, that pain point is particular in community colleges, not only along the traditional lines of like, because we have different races, we have different ethnicities and so on like that, but even subtle things like, you know, as, as an economist, I can tell you the problems I've had trying to teach from, you know, textbooks that were written by someone who thought they were going to write for the entire nation of the United States college students and going, you know what, my, you know, they're using examples of, you know, the trade-off between buying an iPod and, or your iPad and doing this or that. And I'm going, guess what? That doesn't speak to my students at all. But when I or my faculty now can create this stuff or modify this stuff, and in particular, get into the, the race issues or other, you know, other issues. It's it's just really really powerful. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if if that answers part of it or not. But um, yeah. Thank you, Jim. I, I want to turn to Connie and check on our time. Our, our, our... Um, well, you're, you can just respond maybe to Jim, and then uh, I think it'd be fair to pass over to the next presenters, yeah, because um, uh, we could probably be here for the whole two and a half hours, right? Um, so if you want to just respond to Jim, and then people can have the opportunity to continue the conversation in the chat, and then also in uh, Connect. There's opportunities there as well. So if you, you just want to respond, then James, thanks for asking, and then the next presenters will queue up.
Thank you. Una, did you want to respond to Jim or Kim or Joy? Uh, no, I, I'm, you, go, you go right ahead. I, I, just, I think we just all want to say thanks for the other comments um, yeah. in the... Yeah, no, I, and, and I, I'm with you, Jim, absolutely. So thank you very much. And I, I'll, I think we'll all dive into the chat here. So thank you very much, everybody. We really, really appreciate it. And we're excited to, to continue this work. And as I said, uh, we're able to, uh, thanks to the Hewlett Foundation, we'll be able to triple uh, the number of faculty we're supporting this year. So good news here. Yep, and I'll just post the link to the resources again. Okay, thanks so much, Una. Just put that in the chat. And Verena, I know, is moderating the chat and um, providing some provocative questions for us to continue on the conversations there. Um, so thank you so much for your presentation. It did make me think of the emotional labor that is involved with this work for all people um, involved in it. And um, perhaps that's something related to that 60% because it is very emotionally charged and that's hard work, it's difficult work and it's a different kind of work than most educators are familiar with, in my opinion, just adding that. So now we'll just move over then to um, prevent, uh, uh, presentation number two, um, Pluriversal Decolonization in Open Education, Thinking with Islamic Epistemic Traditions, Rouge Nizami, and Elliot Montpellier. So uh, welcome to at least one Canadian presenter I know, and uh, we'll continue with this presentation. Thank you, Connie. I just wanna confirm that everyone can see our screen, but not our notes, because why would you want that? Okay, awesome. I'm Aruja, a trained librarian and open education strategist at Kwantlen Polytechnic University in British Columbia, Canada. And I'm Elliot, I'm a PhD candidate in South Asia Studies and Anthropology at the University of Pennsylvania and an instructor in Asian Studies at Kwantlen Polytechnic. So we work, study and live in a region south of the Fraser River, which overlaps with the unceded traditional and ancestral lands of the Kwantlen, Musqueam, Katsi, Semiahu, Tuasin, Coquite, Coquitlam peoples. This presentation was born out of a shared interest in how secularism, religious understandings about the world and practical concerns regarding building an inclusive open movement intersect in concrete and philosophical ways. We'll begin our talk today by introducing what we see as the problem, the absence of religion as a worldview that is welcomed within Eurocentric educational systems and the creation of barriers that occur as a result of this absence in collective efforts to decolonize the educational system. This includes a case for why we're focusing on Islam. Our framework borrows from literature in open education that calls for a pluriversalist approach to open and is centered on decolonization. So then going forward in the third section, we're gonna describe results from an OER scan that we conducted um, to both present cases of active exclusion or derision of Islamic worldviews from educational spaces. And we're also gonna present a non-exhaustive survey of OER that emerged from Muslim majority countries uh, or take up subject matter relevant to the region uh, and or Islam um, and point to trends in these domains. And then to wrap up, we'll discuss how we see opportunities within uh, the open education movement to learn from and grow alongside Islamic knowledge traditions. So in preparing our talk, like many of you, we turn to UNESCO's recommendations on open educational resources, hoping to find UNESCO's framework for engaging religious identities, communities, and worldviews. So in the OER recommendations, the language we found uh, mentions, among other things, this uh, desire for inclusive and equitable quality OER for all, for all stakeholders. And then there's this long list of sort of categories uh, that they include. So we see age, gender, physical ability, socioeconomic status, those in vulnerable situations, indigenous peoples, those living in remote rural areas, people residing in areas affected by con conflict, natural disasters, and then ethnic minorities, migrants, refugees, and displaced persons. So you'll notice three glaring absences, religion, which is the subject of our presentation, but also race and sex and sexual orientation. In our research, we didn't find a clear answer to why this may be, whether it was explicit or perhaps you know, due to vocal opposition or just mere oversight. 
At best, this representation, this represents an underlying skepticism or deprivileging of the validity of these as useful categories for thinking about people's experiences of life. And at worst, it represents a blatant opposition to valuing religious life, religious worldviews, and racialized experiences within a national or international context. And sadly, either of you know, these could be accurate. So why are we focusing on Islam? So while engaging, um, while engaging the effects of colonialism is not new to our field and we endeavor to take decolonization seriously in our praxis, colonialism and its persistence effects on Muslims are largely understudied in open education. Our contribution attempts to enrich the definition of decolonization by shining a light on secular biases that persist and discount religious life today. So from Palestine to France, from China to India, from Guantanamo Bay to the Bay of Bengal, Muslims constitute a large percentage of the world's migrants, refugees, and displaced persons who are escaping social realities that include everything from outright genocide to poverty and climate change's growing effects. Moreover, many migrants then come to Europe and North America only to face institutionalized Islamophobia and racism in our secular democratic nations. So what we're trying to get at here is that many Muslims constitute those who have taken shelter in the camps and bureaucracies of institutions like the UN and other humanitarian groups. And so we implicate in our presentation UNESCO, the UN and its member states in the global north, whose framing of recommendations like this one that we just talked about on OER, allied ways of knowing and worldviews of the very people they seek to assist and bring together into communities of what they call inclusive knowledge societies. Now we're presenting these problematics not to dwell on the rather depressing state of affairs, but rather to discuss ways of moving forward towards these goals. The framework for our intervention is that decolonization of open must include pluriversal engagement with Islamic intellectual traditions, customary practices, and epistemologies. In a 2015 lecture, Akile Mbembe offers us a working definition of pluriversalism so he writes, and you can see this on the slide here, by pluriversity, we understand a process of knowledge production that is open to epistemic diversity. Is it a process that does not necessarily abandon the notion of universal knowledge for humanity, but which instead embraces it via a horizontal strategy of openness to dialogue among different traditions? Ep epistemic traditions are ways of knowing, ways of understanding, ways of perceiving the world. In the introduction to Open at the Margins, Maha Bali and her colleagues referencing Membe make a forceful case for bringing pluriversalism into open education. And we, you know, we very much wanna take up their call to bring forward non-dominant epistemic stances in open education by attending directly to tradition, which we have pointed out is largely absent. So we take de decolonization as an imperative to rid society from colonialism. This is like our working definition. It's action oriented. It's aware of current and historical violence and oppression, and it seeks to regain and control thought processes. Open education scholars have argued that open can actively engage in decolonization by providing opportunities for liberation uh, from dominant ideologies. For example, if we think you know, um, about the opportunities licensing provides for adaptation or generally how publishing challenges hegemonic norms, but you know, this can really only happen when accompanied by understandings of relationships of power, who gets to frame our movement and whose norms are valued. Otherwise, as Florence Piron and others have argued, open can itself become um, what they call a source of epistemic alienation and neocolonialism. Translation won't save us. It's good for access, but translating a Euro-American canon in OER for the Global South preserves the uneven flow of knowledge production, and making only Northern experiences available through curricula denies embodied realities of learners in the South. Decolonization cannot be done without bringing to the fore the epistemic traditions that have been marginalized by colonization. A turn to indigeneity in open ed has been hugely important. This work has helped shift conversations in, po in a positive direction, yet there's a lot of work to be done on this front. At the same time, we need to think about the effects of colonization on marginalized identities that aren't always contained within the framework of indigeneity. Next, we're gonna discuss our scan of existing OER and present a brief summary of the literature review on specific education re related cases where religious identities intersect with policy, law, and the state in counterproductive ways. Together, these provide insight on successes, shortcomings, and opportunities for advancement. 
We started by searching um, meta search engines for OER. Our search terms were Muslim and Islam, as well as discipline specific searches for religious studies, theology, anthropology, and sociology of religion. We also did searches using filters and tags for different key languages that we deemed both relevant um, and that we were capable of conducting a survey of resources in, and these included English, French, Urdu, Persian, and Arabic. We conducted searches using OASIS, OER Commons, OER in other languages, and the OER by Discipline directory from BC campus. A simple Google search and OER in religion also returned a useful library guide from Mount St. Vincent University for religious studies. So as you see on the slide here, um, some of these methods and then some of the results that we found. So what we did is we sort of generally could classify the types of materials we found into six categories. So we have resources on art and architecture from the Islamic world. We have resources on security studies or international studies kinds of textbooks um, for which there was a large focus on Islam as a sort of political ideology, how it fits into geopolitics. Um, then there were a handful of more humanities focused learning resources, um, things like anthropology, religion textbooks, that sort of thing. Um, lots of language learning materials and philological resources, some things that focus more on area studies, particularly primary source materials, and then a large body of things like manuals, teacher's guides, and other translations. And so this survey that we did of Arabic, Urdu, and Persian OER um, was really sort of as a proxy for hoping to access relevant materials. But really within the scope of this scan, uh, these materials were mostly in that sixth category with a real focus on secular subject matter. So there were really few comprehensive OER relating to Islam and Muslim societies. Um, now, a positive finding is that there were no really blatant, blatantly Islamophobic materials to report on. And so the, the kind of the critical takeaway here is that it's really this critical lack, this like lack of materials um, that's um, that we found and is like the, the main omission, uh, the main issue here. What does exist um, betrays a, a largely outsider view into Islamic societies. So these sort of uh, traditional Orientalist domains such as art, language and philology and then this more recent focus on geopolitics driven by an ongoing war on terror. And of course, in this late, latter case, viewing Islam through a largely political lens has led to a number of off-putting and disproportionate kind of um, focus on Muslim beliefs and worldviews as like being tied to violence. And, and this is of course, deeply troubling. At the same time, we also know that our educational systems are places where Muslim students are regularly marginalized. And in our broader survey of policy literature on religion and higher education, we encountered substantial evidence of this fact. There are a litany of well-published cases in France, Austria, and several other European countries where religious students, but especially Muslim women and Sikh men, um, they've been prevented from embodying their religious identity, let alone having access to educational experiences that affirm those identities. In Germany, the US and Canada and elsewhere, there have been bans or attacks on interfaith prayer spaces at institutions of higher education, which have specifically targeted Muslims. And there are many cases of blatantly Islamophobic content appearing in courses across the West. Another relevant example of this is the banning of access to MOOCs in Somalia and Iran due to US sanctions, as again mentioned by Mahabali and her colleagues. So in this sense too, we regard the publication, uh, the publications being printed at university presses, like institutions, at institutions like Al Quds Open University in Palestine, uh, and the Alama Iqbal Open University in Pakistan as closely connected to our OER discussions and really already doing the work of pluriversal education, but on terms that not, might not formally be recognized as open. That is to say, um, Alama Iqbal Open University, for example, makes publicly available online on their institutional website what appears to be the vast majority of resources required for the programs they offer, though these resources are not openly licensed. Here we on the screen, we just have a an image of um, a sort of an upper level applied research course. Uh, and then I've highlighted uh, the copyright statement um, that sort of assigns copyright to the publisher. So here again, we're returning to Florence Piron and her colleagues arguments on a Northern focus on the technicalities around open access. And we underscore how the availability of these works align well with our decolonizing ethos, but are not currently legible in or as open. 
Finally, there were many openly licensed public domain resources that we encountered either in broader non-repository searches or you know, um, the ones that we knew of because of our subject expertise or perhaps personal encounters with materials. The extent to which these resources, which in many cases more directly engage with Islamic scholarly traditions fall outside of the scope of the OER meta search engines points for an avenue for immediate engagement and improvement in a pluriversal direction for open education. Now in our final section, we're going to turn to some intersections between Islamic knowledge traditions and open education. One of open education's strengths is that it resists it resists rigid definitions of what it means to be open. So we see this in how open education has adopted ideals that predate open ed, like privacy, agency, critical pedagogy, and social justice. This is great. To us, this means that open education presents an opportunity, but all the ideals I just mentioned above can be traced to Western enlightenment ideas. And this is not the only way forward. Increasingly in North America, as we've noted, there's been an interest and a need to focus on indigenous knowledge practices as well as anti-racist strategies. Um, though here again, there's, there's a lot of continued work that needs to take place. In the same way, we should be asking what can open education learn from histories of Islamic knowledge traditions? If we want to decolonize our practice, we have to think outside of our epistemic bubbles as Membe writes, we must both critique the Eurocentric academic model to imagine what alternatives might look like. Those alternatives must horizontally engage with other knowledge traditions. So of course, Islamic intellectual traditions go back way over more than 1400 years. And we can't cover all the details here, of course, but a couple of noteworthy points, I think, for a presentation. One is that medieval Islamic thinkers developed upon European and West Asian intellectual canons. They're largely responsible for, for preserving European traditions from antiquity into the Renaissance period. And then second, um, colonial era, era European thinkers created a hegemonic narrative that really elided this history and made claims about intellectual stagnancy within modern Islamic societies. So opposing this, we sort of really maintain a different picture of a vibrant intellectual tradition historically and in the contemporary Islamic world one that has a lot to offer the movement of open and it, it, provide, it, it currently provides authentic educational models and knowledge traditions for students. This is not to say that these traditions haven't been steered into irreconcilable directions in certain contexts, but it is to add that if open education wants to take seriously the manner in which it approaches education as a universal right, it must be open and engaged with difference. As a start, we suggest considering features of the Islamic tradition, which resonate directly with existing open concepts, namely ideas around attribution and several of the five R's. In many key elements of religious curriculum, these um, exist, there exist traditions of what I'm about to share. Isnad is a chain of transmission. It links a current version and or practitioner to a lineage of transmitters or teachers, usually all the way back to the prophet. And this is a vital system of attribution. The seer is exegesis, often on the Quran, but also in other prominent texts. Um, and it's subject to the rigors of both Isnan and also um, in the event of teaching Ijaza. And here we see revision as a center of this intellectual tradition. Ijaza is an um, it's, it's an authorization to be able to teach, which several prominent scholars argue was a precursor to the doctorate emerging out of medieval Islamic learning institutions. These institutions retain copies of exegetical and other scholarly works, reusing, adapting, and adapting them to their curricular contexts. So this is a tradition that is maintained today in centers of Islamic learning. If we think with these concepts and really in viewing them as generative models of attribution and the five R's, we witness an alternative to the commodified notion of intellectual property that dominates Ameri Euro-American educational systems. And this is something that, of course, the open movement, too, has really taken on as one of its primary considerations. At the same time, this is not just about using Islamic terms or making analogies with Islamic contexts concepts, but instead about finding intersections, learning from, incorporating, and integrating practices are merging from other traditions into a pluriversal model of open. 
These models have distinct orientations to notions of a public good. We can see this in traditions of knowledge production at some of the oldest learning institutions in the world, including the uh, University of El Karawin in Morocco, El Azhar University in Egypt, El Nizamiya in Baghdad, and the Najaf Hauza also in Iraq. Indeed, religious education has in some ways been more resistant to the commodification of knowledge. When we revisit these histories, we also call attention and critique a historical and generally inaccurate understandings of curricula in religious educational contexts. As scholars of many different religious tr traditions have noted, the division between secular and religious training is not always neat. It is important to think of how to adapt what we think of as secular disciplines to religiously attuned life worlds. In work on Buddhism in Laos, for example, Justin McDaniel notes that in English grammar lessons, aspiring monks use examples like Buddha taught the Dhamma instead of see, spot, run. A kind of funny, but you know, uh, a very sort of interesting example to, to engage and, and think through. Finally, we also see aspirational notions of the public good emerging from open university models that have found traction and educated millions of students in post-colonial Muslim countries, like Al-Quds Open University in Palestine and the Alama Iqbal Open University in Pakistan. And so while being careful not to romanticize or dehistoricize traditions of Islamic teaching and learning, we argue in favor of seeking out the convergences between existing and customary practices in the Muslim world and current trends in open education. One of, one of these points may be found um, in challenging the commodification of knowledge. We must, however, also be open to dialogue with parts of the tradition that may not um, immediately be reconcilable with hegemonic Euro American ones. There's a rich Islamic tradition, um, a learning tradition, and, it, and you know, if we take it seriously within higher education, it will resonate with you know, our Muslim communities, but it'll also help undo persistent colonial ideologies of the West. So really to conclude, uh, what we wanna argue for is that um, while open education has argued um, in thinking with bell hooks that we need to engage the whole person in our pedagogy, this is something that um, when it comes to religion, we're not, quite, uh, we're not quite there yet. We do have a robust engagement with this idea and this is evident in how we address costs and barriers to access with practical solutions to mitigate these. Um, but we really need to sort of um, continue to do that work of putting forward decolonizing models for students to make sense of themselves or what George Sefadai calls um, to take control of their own thought processes. This must include the possibility to rediscover holistic worlds, including religious selves, even to the extent that if they choose to bring together their secular lives with their religious lives. And with that, um, we basically conclude, we have some slides here at the end um, that have the full results of our uh, OER scan that you can consult um, at a later time. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Elliot Danirouj. Um, wow, <laughs> just wow. <laughs> um, I think it's such an excellent uh, contribution to this uh, webinar that we're having. And um, I can see, you know, there's uh, uh, this hole, obviously, and uh, its implications for open educators, openness in, in general. Um, I see James. Uh, do you have a question, James? Yeah, sure. Go um, ahead. Thank you, Connie. Well, I just want to say thank you. The, the, the concept of, of plural versality is completely new to me, but it's, it's sort of mind blowing to me. It's, it's something that I've looked for. I've sought this. I've had this, this dichotomy in my head and haven't understood what to do with it about how to reconcile different epist epistemologies with what is supposed to be my academic enlightenment-based worldview. So thank you very much for that. It's a great gift. I really appreciate it. And, and I would really encourage you to write this up because I would just love to use it with a lot of different training and, and professional development. So please write something. For sure. And uh, I also recommend checking out the Open at the Margins volume that really gets into pluriversality and also references the scholars in education, which really brought it uh, brought it to the fore. Yeah, I think we're really indebted to that 
um, piece in particular, it, you know, it's an edited volume and a lot of the pieces uh, within it that sort of got us thinking about this and also were really sort of helpful in uh, breaking past that kind of like thought barrier too that I think we've experienced as well in our own kind of, you know, talking about this. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's a really useful um, volume to consult. Great. Um, we'll, we'll see if we can get that in the chat box for everyone to take a look at. And um, I was wondering too, like um, I only know some things about um, Islam, but I do believe that there's quite a oral tradition within it as well. And um, often with um, higher ed, well, education generally, there's this privileging of the written word. And so did you find anything relating to you know, orality and the importance of oral tradition as part of knowledge sharing and uh, extending it out. For sure. And I think it it's very relevant when we think about Indigenous um, perspectives as well. But it's not when I mentioned that. So this, this idea of tracking um, what was said and who said it and how they may have adapted it or added some uh, context to it, that was all an oral tradition, which was later written down. Um, so it, it's very much, it, it very much also can um, disturb the privileging of, of textual tradition as like the, the only way forward. Do you have anything to add? No, I, I mean, I think that that's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would think so. And um, I can see that, that whole, like the privileging of the written text over other ways. And also um, oral, but also um, the use of the image as well as a mechanism for conveying ideas. Uh, again, the image has also been suppressed uh, and you know not as privileged as the written word for lots of different reasons. So I don't know if that also was something that you had thought about. Yeah, and I would add also sort of a kind of, um... You know, there's a, I think in, 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 cert, in certain parts um, of the tradition as well, there's a much more sort of em, embodied learning. And I think you see this kind of across religious traditions. This is kind of getting um, to the, um, one of the questions in the chat about like our approach to other religious perspectives as well. But, you know, if you look, um, if you, if, I mean, if you look at Christian traditions, if you look at Buddhist traditions, um, if you look at Hindu traditions of learning, there's oftentimes a very sort of like corporal component, um, which involves sort of like moving the body or um, sort of uh, a real focus on things like um, the way that the mouth works in articulating the oral tradition, that kind of thing. And so really, really kind of, uh, you know, religion, the focus on religion here really could also open us up to just different ways of experiencing education as a kind of embodied practice. Mm, yeah, I, I, I would agree, Elliot. I think that's a very useful line of inquiry and lots of, well, this, all I, this whole idea of what is literacy, multi-literacies, different kinds of literacies, it comes into that. Um, I see in the chat, uh, Verena had the question, could your lit review approach be used for other religious perspectives? What are things to consider as we move forward from our own perspectives? So this, 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 um, I included, we included this example um, about Buddhism, um, because I was actually just, I was teaching this week, and I was like, pre preparing this new, um, this new reading to, to instruct and I, I saw these quotes from from Justin McDaniel, and I just thought it was, it resonated so well with what we were trying to get at, and it had this nice sort of um, example. Um, but I absolutely think that the our approach here um, began with uh, it was kind of a, a twofold. One was sort of like using languages that are sort of our research languages, the languages that we know to conduct this research. And so, for example, if you um, were working uh, with Thai and, and Lao, for example, or sort of Chinese and Thai, let's say, um, and you wanted to sort of pursue this kind of approach um, with, a, with an interest in, in Buddhism, I think um, this, this model with the sort of uh, review approach that we provide could be pursued. Um, and then, of course, very similar to what we did. In fact, the research we did, in a sense, would already reveal um, many examples uh, and shortcomings um, when we're looking at other religious traditions. So I do think it could definitely be um, replicated in a sense. Great. Yeah. 
Um, there's quite a few people um, just, you know, posting how much they appreciated your presentation and thanking you for it and helping us to just broaden our perspective. Um, one from Jim Luke, he says, thank you so much for this project and effort. He lives in Dearborn, Michigan, I believe. I think that's what MI means. I'm, not, I'm a Canadian, so I'm not always accurate on my American states. And it's the US city with the largest concentration of Arabic and Muslim overlapping but not identical identities, residents. I call them neighbors. This is so needed and so welcome. If there is ever anything that I can do to connect you to people in Dearborn, let me know. So just growing out the network there. And uh, there's a link to the um, Open at the Margins edited version or edited book. So um, thanks for just referring to that. Um, I would just jump in there to say um, thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. But uh, thanks, Jim, for this comment. And we had the opportunity to go to the I think it's the Arab American Museum. Um, I, I believe it's in Dearborn or just outside of Dearborn. Yep, that's um, in town. <laughs> yeah, and uh, that, it was really, it was a, a really wonderful Just place. down the street. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, great. Um, well, um, any other, oh, I see another, just something just came into the chat just now. Just that it was a terrific session. Thank you, that's coming from Elaine. And, and Beth just said, I love how they just looked at each other like, yes. <laughs> yeah, lovely um, collaboration between the two of you. You can see that and um, lovely modeling for us to see how you can present face to face, it looks like, and in a, a space that you're working together. So um, I think we're getting close to the time then. Um, and uh, so Yerusha, we'll just, uh, go on to the next presenter. So nice to see you both. Great presentation. Lots of excellent ideas coming there. Thanks Thank so you. much, everyone. Uh, so coming up next would be the third presentation today, strategies for assessing and adapting OER for inclusion, a case study. Um, so Suzanne Wacom, Rachel Arteaga, and Mandeep Grewal. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Okay, hopefully everyone can see my screen. Yes, I can. Okay. Um, so we are going to talk about a project that um, kind of came out here, came out of Butte here, um, and share strategies for assessing and adapting OER. Um, Suzanne Joachim is not here, even though she's listed as a presenter, um, but she did contribute quite a bit um, to this. Um, so Mandeep, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yes, um, my name is Mandeep Grewal, and I teach at Butte College. I teach biology over there. And I'm Rachel Arciaga. I'm a librarian. Um, I also do work for the um, Academic Senate for the California Community Colleges. Um, the Open Educational Resources Initiative. And this project kind of came out of the um, grant funding for um, provided from the Open Educational Resources Initiative, the OERI. Um, and um, Mondeep got funding to basically edit a text. Um, and then, um, oops, um, I kind of helped with that process, but I'm going to let her talk about that. So just let me know when you want me to um, yeah. change that. Okay. So I'm gonna talk about this uh, human biology OER textbook that Suzanne Joachim and I curated. Uh, so this is a very long project. So about maybe five years ago, we started this project. So right now we are at the third version of the book. Uh, so the first version was like the, there was a need for a human biology OER textbook because the commercial books were very expensive. So there was an equity issue. And if students got um, um, financial aid to get a textbook, they always got their textbook like um, four, four weeks into the semester. So that's when they had their first exam. Uh, so we thought that there was a need. Um, so in OER, when we looked, there was no human biology textbook. So either we could use human physiology, anatomy, so those were too advanced and just general biology would be too, not too specific for this course. 
So we curated this book um, and then we uploaded this book on Libre Texts. Um, um, I hope you guys are familiar with that. Uh, so this is a platform where we housed our book and it's very easy to navigate and students can download the textbook uh, as a PDF and save it on, your, on their devices. And this book is available for them on the first day of the class. Um, uh, so we thought, you know what, oh, this is a perfect book. We were so happy and we thought like it can be better than that. But in 2019, Suzanne and I, we attended professional development um, workshops. So there's one uh, safe zone training and there was another one that was uh, about the data that they collected about the, the climate at the college. So in, the, in, in those workshops, we learned that this book is not perfect. So this book was affordable, but this book was not um, inclusive enough because students told and even faculty, some faculty and staff, they said that they don't see themselves in the faculty. They don't see themselves in the textbooks that they use or they, they learn from. Uh, so there was a need to make this book more inclusive to make it more representative of the student body that we have. So I took on that project and I applied for another grant from ASCCC. So I, and thankfully uh, they gave me this financial help. And, but then now the question was, how do I make it inclusive? Because I did not know enough, right? So I needed to take some classes. So I took classes and I became part of the diversity committee and also gender sexuality equity team at our college. So I, and also Rachel, our librarian. So I asked if, she, if all of them, they could help me uh, figure out what is lacking in this textbook. So we came up with this survey. Uh, Rachel, can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, so we put together the survey to audit to just see what is lacking in the textbook. Um, and if you guys are interested in using that survey that is on our website, and I will post the link to that and or Rachel, if you have access, you could do that, but I, I'll post it uh, in a minute. Uh, so there are nine questions altogether, but this is just an example. You can you can see three questions over here. Uh, and um, so I gave this survey to about 10 people. So five of them, they returned the survey, they took the survey and Rachel is one of them. And I was amazed uh, to see that if you look at the first question, um, you know, how inclusive this book is as compared to general books that, you know, we use um, at, for human biology. And so there was a range like one to four. So I was disheartened to see that some people thought it was not inclusive at all. And some thought maybe somewhat. Uh, and then the second question was regarding like, um, it's like, how, how do you see diversity in general in this book? Um, so there was like, most of them, most of the people said that, uh, you know, there's only white people. They only see white people. They even the illustrations were of white people and the women's were not like women scientists were not, represented and most of the videos were American and with white people in them. Um, so most information, you know, um, I don't know much about LGBTQ community. So that's why I joined the committee, um, the sexuality and uh, gender and sexuality committee. Uh, so I got a lot of information and you guys can see, you know, there's a list and some of them were eye opening because I was, I, I curated this book the way I was taught. Okay, so there's a man and there's a woman. Uh, there is, and and I was like amazed to learn that breastfeeding is not appreciated by transgender community. Uh, opposite sex, what does that mean? Um, assisted reproductive technology is not, not only for heterosexual family, you know, homosexual family can also expand their family using this technique. So there was a lot of information that I gathered. And next slide. Um, and then after looking at all this information, I went back and looked at my book and I was like, oh my God, is this my book? Did I write that or did I curate that? Um, so this is my book, what it looked like before. You know, this is one example. This is a skeletal system chapter. And this is the first chapter, like first uh, section of the chapter of each chapter is a case study. And then it's kind of discussed throughout the chapter and there's a conclusion at the end. 
So in uh, each case study, there's a character. And if you look at that, that character is American Melissa. And she is, she just uses she and her pronouns. And she's pretty tall and white woman. And that's what I saw throughout my book. I was like, okay, we need to change it. We need to make it more inclusive. We need to show that, okay, I see all of you students. Um, so if you want to change the next slide. Okay, so this is what we did to that particular. So this is one example. Uh, so in, in here, you can see that I changed the name, first of all, because this is a case study. Students sit and talk about it. And I hope that I hoped that uh, there would be a student who would be familiar with this name, Amari. And then I also introduced um, gender uh, neutral, uh, gender neutral pronouns, they, them. And then also, if you can look at the picture that like, you know, that is very inclusive. You can see different skin shade. Uh, and maybe some of them are transgender women, right? They don't have to be cisgendered females. Um, actually, when I had people or my colleagues read these case studies, they had a little hard time reading because they could not connect the plural pronouns with the singular person. So I had a little so, but I just kept it. I was like, you know what? I'm just, I'm going to just keep it. Uh, there are a few chapters which have this case, uh, which have uh, characters with the uh, gender neutral pronouns. Uh, and also I have, in some case studies, I have male names with female pronouns as well. And uh, go to the next slide. Okay, and also uh, I wanted to add something about my culture in there too. Uh, so when, uh, you know, recently we had to rent um, a house and our landlord said, well, could you cook your Indian food outside? It would be nice if you just cooked it outside because, you know, that smell kind of enters into the foundation and then it doesn't come out. And I was like, oh my God, I was like, I needed to tell it to somebody. So I need, I added this nice picture of Indian spices. And, but this chapter is not about Indian culture, Indian cooking. This is about phytochemicals. Uh, so this culture that people bring from other countries, sometimes it's appreciated. Sometimes it becomes cause of discrimination. Uh, so I wanted to add that so that people think, oh yeah, I'm included. So there's something about me in this book as well. Uh, next slide. Okay, so then another example, so this, book, this particular chapter is about macromolecules. So here I'm talking about carbohydrates. So you can see a picture of a person on a wheelchair, but I'm not talking about disability. I'm not talking about wheelchair. So this is actually about cotton candy that she's holding or they're holding in their hand. And um, so there are some aspects of a disability race um, that I've added. And if you can go to the next slide, Rachel. Okay, so the, the most trouble that I had was with the, the reproductive system uh, because this is an OER, so I relied on information that I gathered from outside, from other OER resources. I could not find enough information on uh, different genders, uh, different identities. Uh, so I had this little note, and if you go to the next slide, Rachel. So in this note, I kind of told my readers that, okay, I'm sorry that most of the information in here is going to be about cisgendered individuals. Uh, but, you know, I tried and then I gave some information about what this LGBTQ means. So there is not just male and female, there are people who don't identify uh, with their natural uh, gender. So we have a range of, we have rainbow of genders and identities uh, in America. So this is not what it is. So I hope it will trigger, trigger more research and more literature in this field so that people like us can use that. Uh, so we, I gained a lot of information. So we wanted to put everything together so that if somebody wanted to change their book or audit their book or maybe start a, a new OER so they, they can include all these aspects rather than changing it later. Uh, so we put together this framework that Rachel mostly work, worked on and I kind of helped a little bit. And now Rachel is going to talk about that framework. Thank you. So as a librarian, I help a lot of faculty find OER and work on OER um, and kind of worked with Mondeep through this process. And I thought 
because we were getting a lot of questions from students about like this book, like why can't all instructors do this? Like, wouldn't it be great? Um, and instructors were interested. So I wanted to create something that would help streamline their process. Um, and then eventually um, what we did was used by the state um, that I'll talk about a bit more. Um, I'm just going to, I don't know if I can, oops, I can't pop it in the chat really. I'll pop it in the chat at the end. <laughs> Uh, the link. I, can, um, I can do that. Okay. Um, I don't want to switch screens. So basically, um, I wanted to streamline the process, um, modifying the book, um, like the examples that you saw can make the content and the design better. Um, it will allow more diverse authors and even students to um, contribute to the content. Um, leading to culturally responsive teaching and textbook examples like we just saw. Um, so we can make really relevant resources for our student population. So our population here in Butte County, California might be totally different than somewhere else, um, but we can change the examples and the references that we use um, to be more inclusive of our student populations and just in general. So um, the OERI, um, the California Community Colleges, um, they wanted to develop a process that was similar to this. And since they fund a lot of projects for OER, new and also um, people that are improving OER, they thought it would be a good idea to have something like this for people to use and work with as I went through that process. Um, so we both wanted to make a case for people who were questioning if they should do this, but also for people who like were really committed and wanted to do this, but just needed to see like what practically they needed to do with their um, text. So we do recognize that um, every discipline is going to be different. There's going to be different challenges, a math textbook, what you can look at and do is going to be completely different than say like the biology textbook. Um, and we also know that we're asking people to um, kind of do some difficult work and reconsider um, what they know about their discipline, what they're including. Um, like Mandeep says, like she was writing a book based on what she was taught in school about biology, human biology. Um, so the framework is divided into different areas or components. Um, restorative requirements, those are kind of the main overall requirements of things that you can look at. And then the elements for consideration are the um, areas that are broken down um, into more specific things that you can look at and change. And this will make sense when I actually show you the framework. Um, but we wanted to restore and include voices that have been excluded or marginalized. Um, we also wanted to give um, areas to assess, tips and examples that would help um, meet the requirements that, were that um, are included in the framework. So I don't know if I'll have time to go over all of the components of the framework, but I'll just give some examples. Um, so a, a major thing that you saw examples of, because it's easy to show, um, are illustrations and photos. How can you change those? Um, I know when I was reviewing the biology book, like every single, I don't know what you call like body model of like anatomy, it was basically white and male. Um, as if like that's the only thing that exists in medicine that you would study. Um, so things like that. Um, example names, um, we saw an example of that. Um, more gender inclusive language and pronoun um, pronouns. And then who are you referencing? Who are the people in your discipline or the field that are historical or pioneering? Um, what are current researchers doing? Like how can you look at those? Um, in your discipline. Um, there are a few more things. Um, who are you referencing? Who are you giving credit to? Um, application and examples like problem scenarios. So that is something like say for math that if you write a problem, um, I haven't taken math in a long time, but sometimes you have long word problems. Like how can you be more inclusive and be more relatable 
to um, a diverse audience. What termino terminology are you using? Um, is it the appropriate or the most up-to-date terminology? Um, what keywords and glossary terms are you highlighting? Um, what metadata are you representing? Um, it's very librarian type of thing, but it's good to look at. Um, what perspectives are you um, using when you look at events and issues? Are you representing concepts that are relevant to underrepresented groups? Um, and then we have a section on additional resources, um, where to find images, style guides, things like that. So this is kind of what it looks like. Um, and I'll, I'll post a link at the end. Um, so for examples and photos, like what is the requirement that you want to have to have an inclusive text? Um, you want to be reflective of diverse populations so students are able to see themselves, like the example of Indian food, we have a pretty large population of Indian students um, here in Butte County. Um, at the same time, visuals should not perpetuate stereotypes, like you have to be really um, cognizant of how you're using the images and what they're next to, what the context is. Um, and then these are like ways that you can meet this requirement. Um, you know, analyze the, the connotation, the depiction, depictions in the photos, um, expressions of authority, like really think about how you're using the photo um, and look at the work as a whole and section by section um, to make sure that you are representing um, things throughout in a, um, diverse and inclusive way. So here's an example um, of another thing that you want to look at is include images of people doing actions um, where the context doesn't necessarily relate to their identity. Um, like we saw with the cotton candy example, um, it's just a really easy way to um, be more inclusive. And um, hopefully I'm okay with time. Um, I'm not going to go through everything. I just wanted to show some examples. Um, basically, if you were writing a text and you went through all of these, um, you would be able to create something that is very um, inclusive. Um, okay, I'll pop the links and I just saw in the chat that the link isn't working. I'll pop the links in the chat um, as soon as we're done um, and when I can stop sharing. So the ASCCC OERI um, just, we worked on a project over the summer um, that kind of expanded the framework that I used at Butte and we just published it like a couple days ago. Um, so it was really good timing. Um, I'm gonna provide the link to the whole framework. And then there's also a place where if you have ideas or if you want to use it, you can give um, comments and feedback or even get involved somehow. Like if your discipline wants to um, use this or work with this, um, you can. Okay, I think we have um, the links. Sorry, I can't do more than one thing at once. Um, but I'll make sure that they're the correct one. I, I think it's okay. I think we got the links. Okay, thank you, yeah. whoever did that. I, if I switch away from the screen share, I'll get messed up. So are um, there questions? Yeah, that was Verena. She's helping us out. And uh, I think there's a Google Doc that she's been uh, collecting, collating all the information that's being shared in this webinar, if I understand how that's been working. Um, so thank you, that's a fantastic framework and uh, lots of detail there about how to uh, dive into making sure that you're thoughtful in your equity and not just trying to reach it. You know, like there's many things as you can see, I don't know how many categories you had, but um, there's a, a, a good degree of thoughtfulness there. And the example from uh, biology, that was quite interesting. I, Lots of people were commenting on that that process. Um, Mandeep, I'm curious about um, when you've been using the textbook, 
have you shared with the students about this process of revision? And um, if, if you have, can you tell us a little bit about what that has looked like or felt like? Um, the thing is, like, since I have modified this book, I have not taught this class. So uh, the other instructors have, so I, I did not get a chance to talk to them yet. So I don't have that information yet. So hopefully, you know, maybe I'll get some information this semester and I can share it with that with you guys. So I'm kind of disappointed that I, I, I haven't I haven't used this book in my class yet. <laughs> I understand that's that's a lot of work. And also it's that process of revision and improvement and also I would think it models for the students how um, there can be change over time that we can grow as educators in our understanding about how we educate and our resources and how we need to constantly be rethinking them because they need updating. And I think that that's an interesting also sort of a obviously not tied directly to biology, but certainly tied into this concept of openness and equity and how um, our actions um, are models for our student. So I'd be curious to hear and, you know, what they say. I mean, like even that before and after of the picture of the shoes, that was, you know, it's very clear cut example. And, um, you know, I can see students going, oh, wow, this is interesting. I've never seen a, a professor revise a book in that kind of way. So it could be a great model for them, I guess, is what I'm suggesting. Yeah, so I, I'm teaching microbiology this semester, so I'm not teaching that. We are using OER, OpenStax, OER textbook for that. Um, so sometimes, like, I, I today, this time was my office hours, so I've, mm -hmm. I've changed my office hours, and I told them, like, I'm presenting, and they were like, okay, what are you presenting? So I shared the link to the book with them, and some of the students, like, they emailed me this, like, we're so proud of you, and they see me as, like, Indian person coming from India, like not speaking even much English when I came here and I'm sitting here and presenting and they were so proud and I was like, okay, I'm a good, I, I want to be role model for you guys and you can do much more than me, you know. Um, so it, it is, it's a good encouragement for students, doesn't matter, you know, which class I'm teaching. Lovely. That's really, that's lovely. Yeah, I think uh, our students cheer for us more than we anticipate yeah. sometimes, <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a question from Verena. She said, did you survey the students after you've made the changes? And if you did, what was the feedback then? And so I think that you said you haven't used it yet since the changes. Yeah. I have not even like, I didn't even realize that I should do that. Like I should have done that already before the presentation. So this is a good idea. Like this is a good suggestion. So I'll, I'll do that. Next. Oh, yeah, actually. Yeah. Uh, so maybe timely that you didn't actually get to teach it, <laughs> teach it this semester. Yeah, or, or just like survey the students who are in bio two this semester, even if I haven't taught them. So maybe I'll just mm -hmm. put together something and Rachel's going to help me put together a survey. Right, right. I think that, uh, yeah, that's a good way to sort of just um, calibrate, you know, the changes. And also like if you have to go for funding or whatever, it can help because often it's about creation of new material is often what we see and hear in OER. And that process of revising doesn't always get as much attention. And uh, if you had some evidence through surveys and, and, and that kind of data, you would be able to create a case for, you know, a different type of funding, maybe other types of revisions to OERs that you might be inspired to do. Thank you. Um, Thank and you. Judith says, I'm inspired by you and your work, Mandeep. Uh, glad to hear your students are as well. And uh, Verena says, we are so proud of you, or words to be proud of when they come, especially from your students. And Una says, thank you, Rachel, as well, for your good work as a curator and open license expert, and so much more. Yes, there's lots of, um, lots of heavy lifting in this work, right? There's many pieces, so um, very exciting work that you've been involved in. And we have time for maybe one or two more questions, if there's anything from anybody else. I was wondering, um, Mandeep, um, 
that shows a lot of vulnerability as an instructor. So personally, how did you feel about that? If you wouldn't, if you if you want to share, I I just I admire the braveness to say, "Ooh, that was not that." I thought that was good then, but now I know more, and I'm going to change that because it's not as good as it could be, and this is how I'm changing it. So, do you want to talk a little bit about that, or? Um, you know, like. I just got into this with the you know encouragement of Rachel and Suzanne. I was a part-time instructor for a long time, right? So I wanted to, so first my goal was just to get a full-time job. So I got into OER and then I was like, okay, I'm gonna do, I'm, well, let's just do this. Like, let's make an OER textbook. So first I was kind of like just doing what other people were doing, right? So now I've realized that, oh no, like I have big voice. Like many people don't have voice. So I should, I should include these aspects because it's necessary. Cause, and also I just recently experienced that, you know, when we just rented that place and I was like, Okay, so if I can experience that, people who don't have voice, they can experience a lot. So people need to be educated. Uh, maybe it has to start from the school, like from college. Um, so even educated people don't know how to approach these things, right? It, mm -hmm. It's okay to ask, okay, don't cook, but there's a way of asking. Mm -hmm. um, so I've realized that, okay, I have a weak voice, like I have, uh, you know, opportunity, I have a support from my colleagues, uh, so I should do that. And I'm looking at this in with a different lens now, right, rather than just, okay, I need this job, like I'm just doing it just to get experience to modify my resume, maybe just make mm -hmm. my resume better. Um, but um, yeah, so this is, um, maybe I'm older now too, I think differently. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it, it, yeah, it's always changing. Um, that's the experience of being an educator. And also it speaks all to this idea too about um, um, the privilege of, of, of a secure job and how it allows you to maybe take risks that if you were a sessional, maybe less likely, right? I mean, it, it, you know, that's a whole area of how higher ed operates is, um, you know, sessional instructors, part-time instructors, and risk-taking is, is a different exercise when you're part-time and contract versus having a permanent position. So I think that that's obviously part of it too. Yeah. Yeah. I think Rachel, um, do you want to add something to, if I missed anything, like you, sh you, you saw my, you know, like, my metamorphosis, right? You, you saw me, you know, becoming a different person. I just think that it's a really good way to model for students, like one saying like, you know what, I'm supposed to be the authority, but I don't necessarily know anything and I'm constantly learning more things. And like, this was a huge thing that I needed to learn. And now I'm, you know, giving it to you and showing you. I think that that's, I know that as a student, I always, didn't trust someone that like said that they knew everything. <laughs> um, so I think that like, I think your students can, can really admire that about you and see that um, it's something that we're constantly working on. Yes, I, I would agree. There's a, it, we don't often see people in, like a teacher has that authority and that voice and um, you know, making admission that, oh, I made a mistake, or I know more, I've changed. Um, we don't often talk about that with our students. And yet, it can be probably a really important piece of modeling, like you say, Rachel. So a, a great presentation. Thank you to both of you and um, all the important work you're, you're doing there. And hopefully we'll hear more as there's further revisions or research, etc. So we'll be going on to the next presentation here. And let me just check. Oops. Um, so we are on presentation number four, informed open pedagogy in the classroom, bringing students into working open by Cynthia Mari Orozoko. So Cynthia, are you here?
Yes, I am here. Lovely. All right. Okay. Just setting my timer. I want to make sure we have enough time for Josie also. Okay. okay. So hello, everybody. My name is Cynthia Mario Orozco, and I want to talk a little bit about open pedagogy today. Uh, I know se several of you in this room have heard different iterations of this talk, so apologies for, you know, having to listen to me again. Um, yeah, and I'm also one of the California Community College uh, folks in this room here from East LA College. Oops, God, I always do that. Okay. So in the session today, I want to talk a little bit about my background, just um, how it informs my work, talk about the idea of informed open pedagogy, some examples of it in practice, um, you know, thinking a little bit about my future work, and then my concerns with the open pedagogy, um, with open pedagogy practices. So just to tell you a little bit about me, I am a librarian at East Los Angeles College. I am not an official li OER librarian, but I am an OER librarian for the most part. People ask me OER stuff, but I mostly do instruction reference and outreach. And I do teach a one unit library science class that teaches student college level skills. And I do a lot of EDI work in libraries and community colleges. And for several years, I was most known for doing a blog um, called LIS Microaggressions for Microaggressions in Library and Information Sciences um, that kind of, you know, tapered off. And I'll get into that a little bit. And it was mostly because I was attacked by alt-right internet trolls in 2016 and never fully bounced back from that. Um, I also think a lot about the affordance as a working in closed spaces and what it means to have your work out there openly because I've had a lot of terrible internet work out there. I had a really bad Zanga that I was really happy was killed off when Zanga like lost a bunch of its uh, data. And so that's great for me. And yeah, I'm glad that schoolwork has been disposable in some instances, you know, like I'm a graduate student right now and having graduate seminars where you're talking about tough issues that aren't made public is, is really great sometimes. So that's where I'm coming from. And when I'm teaching Library Science 101, I use this concept of an informed open pedagogy, which I wrote about in a book chapter that I'm sure someone will link for me if I ask. Um, I forgot what it's called, but something about informed informed open pedagogy and information literacy. So what I think it means right now is that it teaches students, actively teaches students about open and it brings them into the greater open education movement. It's not just doing student created works that are openly licensed, but really contextualizing open education, OER and open for them. Students, you know, when they're creating their works are able to individually or collectively decide their preferred individual or collective authorship and licensing. And students can opt out, you know, I don't think that all work should have to be open. Uh, that's scary. And if they want to opt out during the class, there should be an alternative assignment. And, you know, later on, if they decide, hey, you know, maybe I don't want my work on my, my name associated with this, they can take their name off. Thank you, Verena. Oh, and it's inherently aligned with information literacy, which I won't get into too much today, but um, the book chapter is linked there in the chat. So in my first example, contextualizing the open textbook. One of the things that really worries me about my college in particular is that right now our OER conversations is really focusing on the free aspect. And um, I don't wanna negate this because some people, <laughs> oh, there, there are conversations about open that are like open is more than free, but the free part is actually very, very important for places like mine. About 50% of our students are um, considered low income and you know, that is absolutely something that I want students to take away. Like, this is something that will, you know, liberate us from traditional textbooks. But I also want them to understand what the affordances of open are, and not just an open education, but open access. So we talk a lot about, you know, global context of open access. We talk a lot about the early, you know, imperatives in Latin America and making things like Redalic and Cielo available. And also open access as an imperative in Latin America, but also for non English language uh, materials, because a lot of our students are uh, native, sp or native or her heritage Spanish speakers, and so they really like to learn about non English language um, forms of knowledge. Uh, conditions of knowledge production so you know these things aren't neutral and we talk about who makes textbooks, you know, who vets textbooks, um, et cetera, et cetera, and how open education really kind of opens this up to different types of authoring and different types of knowledge production. And if you're in California, we're really kind of 
big on the guided pathways right now. If you're not thinking about, you know, different college majors or professions and what open affords them, you know, it's a very different uh, conversation when you're talking to artists and photographers, et cetera, you know, you're not going to tell them all your work have to is going to be open, you know, they, they have a profession and they have to make money and it's silly, but, you know, we can encourage those students to say, Hey, you know, what if we, um, had, or what if we encourage photography professors to have students do, um, assignments where we can build repositories for the work that, you know, they're doing at Butte, um, or AS triple CC, uh, AS triple C, you know, um, to build, you know, diverse like collections of photographs represented in textbooks, you know, teaching students about Unsplash or Flickr or, or however you want. Um, so I think a lot about like, like what open looks like for different student paths that students are taking. And I emphasize the academic labor and scholar and the scholarly communications crisis, you know, what the conditions that libraries are under to make textbooks or books, et cetera, available and how much publishers are really kind of squeezing all the money they can out of us. And so my first example of a, uh, an assignment I do with my students, but I also do as a librarian for other professors, I go to their classrooms and we have this conversation, is um, one in which we problematize the relationship of textbooks to faculty and colleges. So I just call it if I was a professor or if I were a professor. And so um, in syllabus review day in my class or at the beginning of a semester, you know, we talk about, hey, we have an open textbook. What does that mean? And then students are, you know, of course, overwhelmingly a big fan of, of free textbooks. But we, we kind of start building in different situations, a series of choices. And so first it's like, okay, if you're a professor, you have to choose between two things. So first, your students have to pay $0 um, for a textbook or $200. And of course, you know, if you give those two options, students are going to say, well, I want my students to pay $0. And then the next situation gets, it just gets progressively harder. So students pay either $0 for an okay textbook or $5 for a way better textbook. So even at this point, students are like, well, you know, I really want them to learn and $5 is, isn't that much. So maybe, and this is where we kind of start splitting, splitting off in different sides. Um, and then just, just having these different scenarios. So students pay $0 for a textbook, but you need to spend 100 hours developing your course or your students pay $200 and then the publisher gives you everything you need to, to kind of facilitate this course. And then we can, and then oftentimes even go into like um, <laughs> this scenario, but also, you know, I have, you know, a children under the age of five, I have these like conflicting life things, et cetera, et cetera. And so students really get to understand the labor that faculty are under. And we also talk a, a lot about contingent labor as well. So they, under, they understand the, the realities of what professorships look like at the community colleges or at the university level. Um, and yeah, so they think about the bigger picture. So example two, we talk a lot about student authority. So students are centered as creators. We talk about author's rights, intellectual property. Um, and this is done again in my class as Library Science 101 or in a library orientation for another course. I always refer to students as authors or creators when they talk about when I talk about the work they submit. And I ask them to think about how they want their works out in the world. So if they are to publish the stuff, how do you want to be represented? What is your, you know, I don't want to, I don't really like the word brand, but essentially what is your brand? And so two examples I have in, in links here. So um, we have a keyword and description assignment in Flickr and then a final course scene assignment. This is early on in the semester. Students take pictures of things that are useful in the library that they want to share, that they want on the internet so students can, you know, if someone was Googling ELAC library study room, they could find this on the internet. So they, they, they take a picture, um, they develop a title, they develop a description, this is a description, it has to have a link, and then the students here decided to put their full names. Um, they also have tags down here below. Um, honestly, these aren't tags I would use as a librarian, but you know what? This picture got like over a thousand views, which is actually way better than other pictures in the series. Um, so, you know, the, kind of <laughs> to Rachel's point, like, I don't like, I don't know everything. Like they're probably better at social media and, and stuff like that than I am. So maybe, maybe those are the right keywords anyways. So they're thinking about their authorship. And then at the end of the course, they do a zine assignment. And um, this is the title. It's just a zine about information literacy. And then there's 22 students in the class and there's two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16 out of the 22 students have opted to put their name 
on here, but they knew that they could put a variation of their name, their first name and last initial, they, they could put a pseudonym. Um, they, they really thought about how they wanted to be represented in this book. Um, no students took, took me up on, on not completing the assignment at all. Um, so that was kind of fun. And I think it, it looks pretty nice. So that's example number two. Uh, I also think a lot about self-preservation in online environments. So how do you keep your students safe? Again, you know, I'm coming from a place where I've been attacked online. And so I like to teach students about privacy. You know, when do you use your real names and what's what, what it is associated with? Identifiable information. You know, if you're taking a picture, is your address on, uh, you know, if it's outside your house, can you see the numbers on your house or your apartment? You know, are you is your name bad showing um, in a picture, et cetera, et cetera, like all these little things, you know, like, let's be really, really careful. And uh, metadata, the metadata that's inscribed in, say, a photograph or in a Word document, um, just telling students to be a little bit more careful with these technologies. And students ought to be able to assess what level of open works for them. You know, CC BY for people is fine, but, you know, students might want to not, might not want to do that right now. And that's a decision that should be up should be made up for them. So anyways, I want to talk a little bit about future work looking forward. So my concerns in open pedagogy, um, the appropriation of content. So, um, you know, it's not unknown that BIPOC folks uh, have had their works kind of co-opted or appropriated, or we've been talking about the politics of citation, you know, who is cited and who isn't. So I would you know, when I talk to students about putting your works out openly, you know, people may see your your work and they may not cite you. And that happens. You know, I even with this this whole concept of informed open pedagogy, I've tried to talk with other people who do open pedagogy and they don't want to like associate our ideas with each other. And I'm like, I think they align. I would cite you, but people don't want to cite me. And that's fine. So um, we talk about that. I talk about, I talk to this with students very, very openly. Um, bullying, trolls, and doxing. So, you know, if you're talking especially about like anti-racism or decolonization, those are words that internet trolls literally look for. Uh, when I, I was attacked, the word microaggression was on their radar. They were doing this kind of like they, they were attacking the American Library Association. They were attacking anybody that had the word like librarian and microaggression associated with their names. And then I had my information, um, in, uh, public information looked up. So, so uh, a reporter went through my emails, my public emails. So I teach students about like public email versus personal email. You know, what you put on the written record um, is very, very important. And honestly, I never thought I would be important enough to have my emails, um, you know, looked up by a reporter, but here I am. I don't think all or nothing open is a helpful framework and it reinscribes the oppression it seeks to dismantle. And I think there, like I've said, there are a lot of affordances to working closed. Um, the rules of participation in open work vary. Again, um, it's, it's really, really important to recognize privilege. So, you know, again, I'm talking about my students who, are, you know, about half of them are low income, you know, when you tell them, you, if you're able to make a textbook and you could make X amount of dollars versus zero amount of dollars, um, because at ELAC right now, we don't currently have, you know, stipends for doing open work for authoring open, open textbooks. That is something that I wouldn't fault them for. I would not fault them for wanting to take on a publisher textbook to make some money. Um, it is, it is a real kind of affordance to be able to say I can work open. All right, I think that's all I have. Um, yeah, I, I cut out some slides because I was worried on time and I'm a, I'm a worrier. So I'm happy to take questions or, or look through what's come through in the chat so far. Uh, thank you, Cynthia, that was fantastic. And you were great on your time and um, some really important messages there for us. Um, in the chat, um, just running through that, uh, we'll sort of go up to the very beginning. Uh, Una is always interested to hear about your work. And um, the, the, uh, this comes from Rouge and Elliot. That's a very helpful point to think about, Cynthia, to thank you. That is the benefits of the disposable assignment in certain contexts. So do you wanna talk about that just a little bit more? Cause that had me curious as well and maybe some other people in the room. Uh, so, um, I 
Yeah, I, I um, so right now I'm a PhD student also at, at UCLA and I'll tell you in spring or during this entire pandemic, I've written papers at, and as a, as a PhD student, a, a paper isn't a disposable assignment necessarily. I could turn it into a, a publication, but I have turned in utter crap and that are just, you know, I'm just literally, you know, putting ideas out there. The ideas aren't bad, but I'm like, this, this work deserves to never see the light of day. Um, but it was a good assignment for me to get ideas out there, even though I don't have any intentions of making a publication. I think students do the same things as undergraduates too. You know, I'm using this paper to get some ideas out there. I don't want anyone to see it, but I want you to see it. I want my instructor to see it. And I want to give, you know, I want you to give me some feedback or sometimes they don't even want feedback. They just want the grade. Um, I'll be honest. Um, yeah, well, I would agree. I think uh, I like that idea that as the creator, you, you're choosing, right? Um, just like you would choose your format as a creator, you know, how you're going to be presenting your ideas as well, um, but also choosing when and where and why you would want to share it. And also like even degrees of sharing. Like sharing it within your class obviously is going to be different than sharing it, you know, more broadly. So that those nuances, I agree. I think sometimes uh, there's a lot of binaries, black and white, you know, either you're open or you're closed. And to me, I think you're right. It's very much this continuum and being thoughtful around that. Um, Liz um, was just adding, adding that last year, Cynthia participated in OEG Voices. That's OE Global's podcast in an episode hosted by Una Daly. And there's the link to the um, podcast there. And also the link to your uh, text is in the chat box. And uh, some of that will also be going into OEG Connect. And um, Kim loved your scenarios. And James felt that uh, number two especially shows so much respect for students. And a real, so I, I would totally agree. Mandeep. Due to social media and the environment, students do not realize the danger of sharing personal life and disinformation. It's good that you teach them. Yeah, and from re some really important examples, I think it's not it. It's the type of when they know that you've experienced that, they they probably listen and pay attention differently than just a generic, you know, be careful with social media kind of messaging or that kind of conversation. Did you want to have any comment about the student reception about when you talk about uh, disinformation, social media, privacy? Yeah, I think students understand that that happens. You know, you see um, people get taken down on social media all the time. Usually it's like, in, <laughs> I mean, in ways that maybe is perceived as good. You know, somebody who is saying um, that they have a fake COVID vaccine card, for example, um, getting called out and then getting fired by their employer. That's like, oh yeah, they should get fired. But it's like, you know, that, 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 that kind of attack. Can, I mean, I, I don't actually mind that kind of attack. I'll be honest. Um, it, it, you know, it goes both ways. You know, people can perceive you as being, you know, I don't know, antithetical to their, their worldviews and therefore try to do a similar thing. And so that is a real danger with, with the environment that we, we operate in and, and students go, okay, yeah, I, I, I've seen it, but I didn't think it could happen to me. Um, now that I know someone personally that this effect, this is affected, um, it makes me think twice about it. And it is, it's not like, I'm not being stodgy and saying, don't use social media. So I think they appreciate that. I'm like, social media is actually really, really powerful, but it is also incredibly dangerous um, in the wrong, hand, like in the wrong, you know, uh, interactions with folks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. Um, yeah. And a good message to be, you know, just talking with them about it and having them understand that there's consequences and that you've experienced those. Uh, James uh, also points out that um, when we're talking with our students about assignments, it should, the point shouldn't always be about open, but maybe more the concept of agency. And also Cronin, uh, Verena adding that uh, Cronin in 2017 suggests we need to consider open, open readiness when considering open pedagogy as well. So I would agree. Um, I love that title of the informed open pedag pedagogy, right? So being thoughtful in that. Um, do you have a closing remark? 
because we have a little bit of time, maybe two or three minutes. Sure. Um, James asked a question about uh, elaborating on why CC BY may be undesirable or not recommended. I have nothing against CC BY. It seems like some of the um, open or nothing folks will say everything CC BY or nothing. And mostly my, my criticism is just saying that everything has to be CC BY and, and thinking that the other Creative Commons or non-Creative Commons licenses are any lesser than CC BY. Um, I think you know, people have their reasons for using any of the licenses that are available and that's why they exist. So mostly I just want students to know what's available and make those decisions for themselves. Um, you know, there's instances where I don't want, when I don't want to work CC by, and I tell them that as well. So it's just like, these are my reasonings for doing what I do in different contexts. And then you make your decision. Great. Okay. Oh, and by the way, I, I was going to tell you, I love your t-shirt. I recognize that logo. Yes. <laughs> Back in the day when we could meet face to face in California. Uh, and Jim Luke says, amen, all the licenses of value. And indeed, some of the other licenses actually promote the uh, commons better. Yeah. So the concept of the commons and it's nuanced. It's not all, in the, all or nothing. So thank you so much, Cynthia. And I think we're ready to move on to our final um, presenter here. So mapping desire lines into the OER classroom by Josie Milliken. Oh, you're, you're muted, Josie. <laughs> Thank you everyone for sticking around for this final session in a series of incredible sessions by others. And uh, so interested in talking more about each presentation, but um, I'll, I'll forge ahead with my own. A little bit about me, I'm the Acting Dean of Distance Education at Pima Community College. I'm also a yoga and wellness instructor. Focus areas include open pedagogy, OER, instructional design, agile, social justice, equity, inclusion, wellness, embodiment, and uh, collective liberation. So our path today, or our desire line, if you will, is to discuss first, what are desire lines? Second, how do desire lines relate to open education? What are some practical applications of desire line thinking? So regarding what are desire lines, the, uh, they're also called desire paths. They're also called herd paths, lots of different names. They've uh, long been used in urban planning, architecture, landscape design, and other fields to plan and develop designs and structures that align with human behavior. So here are a couple of images that I've taken of desire lines in Tucson, Arizona, where I live, the um, traditional home of the Tohoorah and Pascayaki tribes. And so you can see here how they actually play out in terms of the land. You have this structure, these sidewalks that are meant to serve as pathways for people to take, but then you see how natural human behavior chooses an alternative path or at least a substantial amount. Here are some other ones that I've taken closer to my home. This was the actual University of Arizona back there in the background. And then uh, we have here a couple of of, uh, I intentionally left the litter the images of the litter and I thought that's not very pretty all that litter, but it also speaks to this whole concept of uh, behavior. And then again, that's student housing in the background. So it's a very interesting dynamic to see that those lines of natural human behavior contrasting with all of these structures that are meant to enforce the this understanding of how people think and behave and navigate in the world. So that brings up the discussion of how do desire lines relate to open education. And what I love about desire lines is this is a concept that I learned about as an undergraduate in uh, years ago in a sociology class and there were a couple concepts that really stuck with me and one is 
desire lines and how they serve as paths that indicate desire of human behavior. Here's a quote uh, from Jane Jacobs, uh, environmental activist, and this is an article from the 1950s, arguing in favor of desire paths and how they should be considered with urban planning and uh, building design and infrastructure. The quote is, there is no logic that can be superimposed on the city. People make it and it is to them, not buildings, that we must fit our plans. So it's a quote that emphasizes Jane Jacobs's view and the view of many others that the, people's, the people must be considered first prior to the construction of these spaces that predictate how people interact and behave. It's, a, it's not everyone of course agrees with this and we don't see a lot. There is one university that has that was constructed, uh, at least the pathways and the sidewalks, um, the administration argued that, successfully argued that the sidewalks and walkways and all of that, that they wait to actually construct those until they saw the paths of students and natural human behavior on the campus. And then they subsequently then uh, determined where those pathways would best facilitate people's needs. So what, in terms of why thinking in terms of desire lines, the emphasis is placed on students. The instruction is based on students' learning preferences, which we know that can span several different, countless different uh, dynamics. The premise is based on what students show us they need rather than what we think they need. And to me, this one is the huge, the, the item that I would I, I would highlight and underscore as the most significant here is so often curriculum instruction planning is is based on what is thought that the students need rather than what we actually have evidence for rather than what behavior shows us and it's not always what they tell us because behavior, because those what they tell us and express to us comes within the confines of environments that are not always conducive to honest and open conversations. Also, the language brings us out of the technology and into our minds and bodies. And um, Uruj and Elliot brought up embodiment earlier, and that is a, a huge part of this because when we are navigating in technology so much, there's a tendency to become disembodied and to separate from bodies and to uh, disconnect from our awareness of others and others as humanity. Also, desire lines illustrate the offering of multiple methods of assessment, communication, representation, presentation, and expression to honor diversity in student populations and multiple paths to success. Uh, many of you, or not all of you, I'm sure are familiar with UDL. So desire line thinking, this is, this is my argument of, of what I would classify as a term that I've called desire line thinking would consist of listening and observing, giving students voice and agency, involving students in learning, engaging students as co-creators in the learning, which we know is a very concept, very embedded within open pedagogy, and working to eliminate bias and preconceived ideas from course design and teaching. And this last one is, is so significant because these confines that we're working within often, if not always, are represent the archaic and hierarchical structures from set, sent from from uh, decades and decades, if not centuries prior, but have not been deconstructed to a point that they can be reconfigured in ways that don't continue to have traces of those archaic systems. So desire lines in open education fosters equity and inclusion where students are offered options 
and or create their options based on their learning needs. Flexible instructional design, observing and adapting to student behavior and needs. And then again, that decentered learning and student agency where students are co-creators in the learning experience. Um, here's a little bit on desire thinking and instructional design where it comes from observing student learning and behavior, identifying frameworks that support that learning behavior in connection with outcomes, and then implementing student-focused design thinking into instructional design. So here's an example of that. Um, and this is an actual example that it happens all the time. And it happened, I actually discussed this, this same exact thing a week ago with a specific student about a course that this student had complaints about. And this, the student expressed that the video, the video lecture in that course was, was archaic. And it had, it was recorded in a very low resolution. It, it wasn't engaging. And he said that the reality is that all of the students in this class are going out to this YouTube site and this YouTube site. And so that that indicates that, well, look, this is understandable that students are searching online to get the information they need. We all do that. And so why not consider that when we are putting together our courses, not giving them links, but giving them the openness to go explore and find the answers and then bring them back. And then so this item here just uh, represents that approach. Here's another example. This is a biology class we offer at Pima Community College designed by a department head by the name of Robert Wakefield. And it's, it's constructed in a way where it's very recursive and all student centered. So students go out, they're, they're posed with all of these different uh, concepts and they're asked to go out and find their own information about, they choose their topics and they teach each other. And that's what they build from to create their final projects. Another way that this manifests is with student success in course planning, where we observe students' modality choices, design course schedules to align with students' modality choices and continue observing and learning from student behavior. So an example of this at, at Pima Community College, and perhaps this reflects an example that you all are familiar with, is that in, within this pandemic, uh, we've, we've, we've come much closer to a lot of different equity issues that impact online learning. We've always known of them and how, and looking at success rates. And at Pima Community College, we see clear evidence that success rates for marginalized communities of our students or underrepresented or underserved members of our college community, those are lower than those from other demographics. And so in terms of looking at that student success, there has that often what comes from that is a sense, a view that, well, these students need to take face-to-face -face classes because those success rates are higher. And the, the concern with that, well, that's not their need. That's not their desire. These students, if they can't take these online classes, which they need to fit in to be able to uh, make space for in their lives with, with all of the complexities that they are often faced with in their lives, then they, they would quite easily gravitate towards another educational institution. And so that's been a little bit of a, of a dynamic where how do we, well, then what do we do? And so then at this point, one of the answers is, or one of the responses is to offer success coaching, offer tutoring, offering all these, all these different things. And, and my, my view on that is those measures do evidence an increase in student success. But what's not often talked about is the increased amount of labor required on those students to successfully complete a course. And so there's a need to, well, what's the structure? 
and what are the desire lines of, of these students and how can we reconfigure this structure in a way that's much more amenable or that recognizes these the unique differences, the unique wording, some kind of flexible way. And I'll get to that a little bit later in more detail to help these students, to guide these students towards success without requiring all these different external measures. So this is an example of, of that and uh, of how to address all of these issues in a different way. We have documented concerns with our online math courses, which have a much lower success rate overall than many of our other courses. And so what we're doing is forming a study group to analyze Math 101 master and LMS data to get a view of demographics and student pain points. And then from there, redeveloping Math 101 master based on study group findings and recommendations and also um, developing additional student support mechanisms. So here we get to the challenge of the LMS. And this is a puzzle that I'm constantly uh, struggling with. When I, I have also been an instructional designer and, and in that work, I've actually been designing courses for about 20 years. And when I first started, there wasn't even LMSs. There was just Dreamweaver and websites and, and uh, discussion boards. And in a way that was great because there's a lot of flexibility and freedom in that. And with the construction of LMSs, there are more constraints, these learning management systems like Brightspace D2L and Canvas and, and um, Blackboard and all of the others and Moodles one too. And often what we see is that they are constructed in a way that simply reflects and represents these hierarchical and archaic methods that have emerged, that have, have lingered in that instructional design atmosphere for, for over time. And, and, um, and even the term learning management system, I mean, faculty do, are not considered learning managers and so or neither are instructional designers so i think that term itself is even kind of cold and very rigid and illustrates the problematics of what we're expecting in terms of how these spaces can foster equity inclusion a diversity of learning styles and all of those different pieces and so i love this quote from laura nichols which is from an art a, a a scholarly essay that's in the theory of society. And that quote is urban planners and landscape architects respond in different ways when such paths appear on planned landscapes. Some believe that desire paths are useful in guiding the redesign of such spaces. Others think such paths are problematic and should be discouraged with the use of barriers and other means to impede their development and further use. And I would side with the idea that desire paths are useful in guiding the redesign of such spaces. I would love to see more conversations and, and dialogue on how, what are the problematics in terms of, of equity in these learning management systems? Um, what are student, how are students actually using them? What data can we see that shows their paths that shows the pain points of where certain of, of some of of our demographics in terms of where they drop off and what can we learn and if you think of lmss for the most part they're very point based systems that emphasize that that focus on points and they're also very uh, rigid and linear in ways that facilitate the individualistic learner, but not the collective learner, which the United States is a very individualistic culture, that sense of an individual can pursue and find their success on their own. But the reality is that many of at Pima Community College are underserved and minority 
and upper represent underrepresented students are from these more collective cultures, which these many of these learning management systems do not easily facilitate. And so finally, my final thought is that engaging desire line thinking with open pedagogy has theoretic potential for shifting perceptions of learning structures, instructional design, curriculum, and te teaching practices towards learner behavior and needs. And so that's everything that I, and I would love though to hear your ideas about what are some ways you can involve this kind of thinking in institutional planning, curriculum development, and course redesign. And I'll end finally with this last quote from Ellie Violet Romlin, which is that when cities lack the paths pedestrians need, people vote with their feet. And so it's essential that we look at how people are voting with their behaviors to determine how we can construct these, our methods of learning to best fulfill students' needs. Well, thank you, Josie. Um, a very provocative presentation uh, to end our webinar today, that idea of the desire lines. And um, as you were presenting, I started thinking of different university campuses that I have walked on and just how you inevitably would find shortcuts. There were always shortcuts, right? And so, uh, you know, those desire lines of wanting to get somewhere faster or more expediently or in a way that obviously wasn't uh, sort of like the train track of Moodle or some of the uh, LMS, right? Guiding you in a certain kind of way and therefore shaping your behavior, shaping your choices and uh, not necessarily reflecting some of the things that students want. So in the chat, we have a few minutes yet to talk and just uh, take up your idea here. Um, Mandeep uh, shares that desire lines originate because many think the same way. One person cannot create those lines. Yeah. Uh, if everyone thought differently, we would see a random network of pathway, uh, pathways. So it's true. Usually you have one person taking a shortcut and then pretty soon it gets pounded down. So that's that concept of it's not just one, it's many people sort of taking that route. Um, Kim adds, I love this analogy, desire line thinking, really cool connection between human behavior and philosophy behind open education. And Beth adds, also encourages risk taking. What will happen if you take this path? And so to step away from autopilot, perhaps. Do you want to have any comment there, Josie? Yeah, I think um, risk taking is a good thing. And it, it's uh, one of the agile, which is a, if you're not familiar with agile, it's a project management. Uh, it's, a, it's a project management style. And it, uh, the idea is that take a risk, fail fail fast, fail often, and, and we don't encourage that enough. We really put a high, and a lot of this is cultural, we put a high price on failure. And so that idea of, and, we, and it's emphasized in our very points-based system rather than labor-based is that um, if you, that the consequences of failure are extreme. So, mm. so yes, I also love the way that it, that it does in, in that idea that it does encourage risk taking and that acknowledgement that there isn't just one way. Um, and along with that, it's that connection with the land. Uh, mm -hmm. Technology has the potential to disembody us. Um, to it's it's wonderful because of the opportunities that it offers, but it's it. We see, we've seen an increase in polarization and all of these different pieces, which in a way come from being disconnected from, from embodied experience and interactions and recognizing what it means to, to be a human, mm -hmm. be connected. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, yeah, lots of 
lots of possible connections there to that whole understanding of human behavior, human choices, rather than narrow, narrow constricting choices. Um, Estia says, Josie, I enjoyed your argument for desire lines in open. First time hearing about these. I feel like there needs to be a balance of students and we do not know what we do not know. Part of the function of education is to expand our meaning horizons, to not follow in the paths we are predisposed or used to, but to take the untreaded path which, which a guide teachers can show, right? So that balance perhaps between sometimes having a path is actually what you need, right? Like, you know, it's not always necessarily a bad path, but I think it's about maybe having that agency and choosing it. Again, she really enjoyed your presentation and thank you. Una says, thank you, Josie. I hope you'll share your slides. The quotes you shared were really amazing and love to reuse and dig into the resources. So if you could make sure that you um, share them um, on OEG Connect, other people would be interested to see them. I took a few notes as well. So yeah, I'd love to see the resources. And from Beth, oh, how some of us are rule followers and afraid to step off the path, right? And um, Josie, there's your link to your slides. And thank you. I love the idea of stepping away from the technology and getting into the minds of student, students. What are they going through thinking and what do they need? I really love the student-centered thinking behind your idea. You've given me so much to think about. And that's from Nick. And Kim adds, this reminds me about the issue of student cheating. If students are cheating, how can we involve them in altering the path to learning? Do you want to comment on that juicy one? I'd love to. Um, and I, that's a really good question. And it really boils down to what kind of cheating are we are we discussing? If it's if it's um, plagiarism, then there's the question of um, what would what would explain that desire line that ended up with that plagiarism route and there, it could be many different things. It could be a lack of, un, which is the one as a, um, also I'm, I, I've taught writing for most of my career and off the majority of the time, what we consider cheating right off the bat is actually lack of understanding of how to paraphrase. And so mm -hmm. a lot of this comes from trusting students more. There is a lot of studies that show that students are not inclined to cheat any more now with the additional resources they have than they were 40, 50 years ago. And then that gets into the discussion of proctored exams and, and this just real like um, fierce concern about preventing students from cheating so much that we put them, we require them to be uh, filmed and so that every movement is, I mean, imagine how that impacts anxiety. And I get so anxious when just, I, I'm also a learner. I'm always learning and taking courses and I get extremely anxious when there is no proctoring. And, and so I think what it, what it really comes down to is trusting students more, but the, the students are, are there for the, the, let them show you that they're not. And mm -hmm. often we interpret cheating as showing that they're not, but there's a lot more hidden beneath in, in the roots of that pathway, if you will, that we need to investigate and look at. Mm, yeah, I, I would agree. It's a sticky one. There's lots there. Um, Vrina said, you mentioned the labor needed for students to follow their desire lines. Did I understand that correctly? And if so, could you expand on the, that idea a bit? Sure. So often we see that remediate it, it kind of relates to remediation like if, if the student isn't finding success within the structures that are going to be provided and have been provided then what are the remediation services we can provide tutoring or success coaching or independent skill building all of these different things and that we don't talk about how much additional labor that requires for the student and so it's worth revisiting that question of what are the competencies that the student uh, needs to gain to, to be able to, to exit this course and have the understanding and skills that they need. 
And then what are we requiring of them to get there? And we holding them back. And how can we facilitate better facilitate those paths to learning without without requiring this need to find ex labor to to expend labor outside of the course? And and this gets to Oruja's note below about points based versus labor based measures, which is. Um, which we've seen a greater push towards is like contract grading and other alternative methods of grading that look at the labor involved and recognize that uh, in a different way in the context of points. Right. Yes. Yeah. Thanks for getting to that comment from Haruj. Um, yes. There's lots of um, changes that we have to uh, consider and be open to. And um, the point of the desire lines is observing the behavior. And what does the behavior tell us? And um, sometimes behavior, of course, doesn't always align with words. Students will sometimes say things, especially to authority, that they think is perhaps what authority wants us to say. You know, what they, you know, what, you know. So they're in that conflict. But yet the behavior is very indicative of what is really going on. So uh, conceptually, I just love that idea of the desire lines and looking for the behaviors guiding us and helping us to think again about some of our choices and how we are proceeding. So um, a great session. Thank you, Josie. A lovely way to exit out. Um, I think we're just over like one or two minutes over time, according to my watch. So not, not too bad. Um, I wish everyone um, a lovely evening, wherever you happen to be, or uh, maybe even late into the night or not quite into the next morning, I don't think, but um, nice to have everyone here. And yes, um, it was enjoyable to be here. I, I've actually really enjoyed just talking and helping people move through the presentations. So I encourage conversations to continue in OEG Connect. It's a great, uh, not just oh, you know, during the time of our conference, but throughout the year. And it's uh, really important that we you know, keep working on that community, building out and learning from each other. So um, lovely to see you all. And uh, hopefully one day we'll meet up maybe face to face. So bye for now. <laughs>